Thank you both, Chairman. That's good. Um, all right, let's open the Bible, shall we, to uh, 2 Timothy, chapter 3. I was thinking about uh, your talk this morning, I got up early, um, to be inspired, and uh, all sorts of things are on your mind, but you clarify it Sunday morning to make sure you know what you're talking about. And I think it's, you know, the things of God are very simple. Sometimes we forget that, sometimes, uh, and that's my topic, that it's not complicated, being a Christian, walking the Lord, getting saved. It's not complicated. It's easy. And um, I know there's a lot of scriptures here telling us what to do and what not to do and advice and so on and examples and history. It's a big book. So how can it be that that simple? There's so much written about it. And what I'm going to do is, uh, this morning is go through the scriptures that I like, simple ones, to remind us that it is simple, that it's simple because God's in control. Um, we were brought up in churches, no doubt, where we were taught about what we had to do for God. So we weren't good enough, we had to do more, you know, believe more, confess more, maybe, depending what you were brought up. And it was all up to us. But as we discover reading the scriptures in the New Testament, because of Jesus' sacrifice, because he paid the price to make us righteous, to make uh, us uh, without sin, um, then it's really up to God uh, what he's going to do with us and how he's going to lead us. So if you're a visitor today, maybe that's something you've heard for the first time, but I will back it up with scripture. We're reading in 2 Timothy chapter 3 here. Um, and the context is about the last days. It says this, know that in the last days, perilous times shall come. And so as we're getting closer to the end of this age, Jesus' return and so on, um, they knew what was going to happen. They knew life was going to get better. It wasn't going to be easier for Christians. It was going to be um, for perhaps uh, more stressful. But we read a bit further. For men should be lovers of their own selves, covetous, or greedy, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful and holy. And we've read these scriptures recently, but I want to go down to um, verse 5. At the same time, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. And in the early church, when Paul's writing here to Timothy, there was only one church. There was only one way of doing things, right? I, I, from memory, I googled uh, how many denominations there are in America, and from memory, this is a few years ago, 32,000 different churches saying, we're right, come and join us, we're the right ones, we're the best, right? 32,000, how did it get so confusing? And the Bible says here, the big key is that they have a form of godliness. They're trying to live a godly life and, you know, and be caring and charitable and all those sort of things that are good traits. But they deny the power of God. They prevent God from doing what he said he'd do. The, the message to be born again, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to receive the Spirit of Christ. And the Bible says we don't have that Spirit. We are none of his. And... Uh, and that's the, the tragedy here in verse 5. They deny it, and it says, from such, turn away. Don't, don't be uh, influenced by that train of thought that you don't need it. It's not for today. There's a, something else you can do to be right with God. And that's what makes things confusing. And when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, almost, well, next month would be 45 years ago. You know, I know I look so young, and it'd be hard to believe that, but I was... 23, and, uh, and you know, I talked to somebody on the street, and that is what we were excited to do, uh, and they'd be telling me, oh, no, that's of the devil. We go to a church where they say, speaking in tongues is of the devil. And I'd say, well, how come all the disciples, Jesus' mother, you know, the Corinthians, the Ephesians, you all spoke about this experience of receiving the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. Where does it say it's the devil? Oh, I know, that's what we've been taught. You know, it's You've got to be careful about these spirits, you know. I say, well, this is the Spirit of God we're reading about. Right? But, you know, that's how, how things got so off the track, and you may have had the same experience. People know a bit more about it now because, well, people are reading the Bibles, not following the fellow up the front. But going further, we read, it says here, verse 7, ever learning and never, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That sounds like a bit of a paradox, doesn't it? You, you're supposed to learn, you're supposed to read the Bible, you're supposed to try and understand, 
And it says, no, there'll be a, a type of philosophy, this type of love of wisdom and knowledge that people will be so into getting information. It's just like the computer today. There's so many different things, you know, and uh, conspiracies and ideas and, and uh, you know, opinions that it will actually take you away from the truth. And it says that's what it's saying here. Uh, this pursuit of knowledge, uh, different opinions. It reminds me of a, a lady I met last Sunday, a lovely lady, and the uh, first time she came along, and so excited. We were praying for the Holy Spirit, and uh, she hadn't received, and uh, she prayed some other church to come along, so excited, and we are praying, and I thought I, to myself, I've never seen somebody so excited about this. This is going to be a really good sister in Lord. Well, I do hope we see her again, but she's told us that she's going to look around a bit more at other churches. And I'm thinking, hang on a minute, who switched her enthusiasm off, right? How did it go from hot to cold in, in a matter of a couple of days? Uh, but, you know, it's our choice. And so the Bible's warning here, and I'm just picking this up because I want to talk about my theme, that it's not complicated, uh, things of God. The, the two things that do make it pro uh, problematic is this fact that people are denying the power of God and substituting superstition and tradition and all sorts of things, do's and don'ts, instead of what Jesus promised. And the other aspect of ever learning, trying to work it out for themselves instead of just humbling themselves and doing what God said. And, uh, you know, it's not you in the Old Testament, Pastor Kim was talking Friday night, about uh, Job. And uh, we read about the time of Israel in the wilderness, in Exodus. Had lots of needs, did lots of whinging, but never prayed. It's remarkable, isn't it? God's leading them, and nobody said, well, let's pray about this. You know, we haven't had water for three days, getting a bit thirsty. You know, where are we going to find water? Well, we haven't got a lot of food. You know, we're going to find food. Nobody said, let's pray about it. They just whinged, complained. And similarly in Job's case, 42 chapters are saying, I didn't do anything wrong, you know, I don't deserve this. And, uh, you know, I'm a good bloke. 42 chapters of that before he actually prayed for his friends, it turns out, and uh, God blessed him. So, you know, this aspect of depending on God just doesn't come natural to us. We want to depend on ourselves. We want to work it out for ourselves, you know, you know, if we... If we're a bit nicer, a bit better, you know, we'll make it. And we're left in doing so. You leave Jesus Christ's sacrifice out of the equation. And so look, what is simple? Let's go to Matthew chapter 18. So we read about complicated, and I don't recommend that. Um, and so we're going to simple now. And as Josh said, and um, uh, your children do receive the Holy Spirit around nine years of age. My children or received about nine or ten. Um, and uh, like Josh, they, they knew it was available. They'd come to a, an age where they thought, well, I'll get this And in our fellowship. We don't baptise them until after they receive the Spirit. We don't really know what they're, they're thinking or understanding. We don't pressure children into um, getting... No, we don't pressure children into doing anything. Um, and by so in, in that situation, out of their, their own desire and their own faith and, and, and uh, humility, they get filled with spirit. It's wonderful to see. And their little lives change a bit. Um, not as much as adults, of course, but, and it's great. So people who receive the spirit at nine years of age, you, you know, walking the Lord has to be simple for a nine-year-old to succeed. You know, it can't be complicated. It can't be, you know, demanding much. It can't be grievous. To a nine-year-old, we'd, we'd give up. But uh, as Josh said, he's had a good life. And here in chapter 18, we'll read in verse 1, it says, At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? A bit of competition amongst them, different stages. Look, I want to sit on your right hand, and, and he can sit on your left hand. What about it, Jesus? Can we be you know, second in charge here? And uh, in this case, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted become as little children, uh, you shall not enter into the kingdom of God. Whosoever therefore shall uh, humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And who shall receive one such little child in my name receives me. 
But whosoever shall be offended by one of these little ones, or sorry, offend, one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged around his neck and that he should be drowned in the depths of the sea. That doesn't sound like a good choice, does it? You know, a millstone's pretty big and, um, you know, drowned in the sea doesn't sound good. And so what he's saying here is that, you know, it's very simple to follow the Lord, but it requires humility. It requires something that converts you. The disciples had followed Jesus for quite a while at this point. They'd seen the miracles, you know, they'd seen Jesus feed the 5,000 and, and seen the dead raised and the lame walk and so on. And so they were believers. You know, they'd called him Lord. They called him Christ, the, the, the anointed. But um, Jesus said, no, there's a time when they were yet to be converted and then become as a child, right? Converted and then be a child, remain humble. And so we'll read about what he's talking about here in John chapter 3, because um, to be a child doesn't sound like too hard, does it? And the thing about, it points out, I mean, we can be encouraged to be like a child in many uh, ways, you know, be persevere. Children have a way of nagging their parents until they get what they want, right? They've perfected that at a very early age. Um, just keep going, keep asking. And what encourages us in our prayer life to be similar, you know, to ask, keep on asking. But in this aspect, he points out that it's humility that um, children are famous for. Um, they haven't learned to be proud yet or, or seek too many opinions. A child will respect what the parent says up until a certain age. We're not talking about teenagers here at the moment, but, but that would be a youth. The Bible talks about that age group being a youth. But, but a child is definitely you know, a toddler, a little one there that um, thinks their parents are the greatest mum and dad in the world and, and whatever you say, they believe. And maybe it seems a bit naive, but the Lord says we have that uh, attitude towards God if we're not questioning him. How dare we question God? You know, I think I know a bit more than you do about this God, you know, apparently. But, but uh, questioning, then uh, we will succeed. And so that's not hard. And I think the first step to believing is to stop arguing. You know, if you can do that, you're making progress. Um, you know, I could never, before I got saved, I could never pretend to be a Christian or imagine that I was right with God or that I was going to heaven. You know, people would tell me these things, but I thought, well, you know, I just can't pretend uh, to do that, right? But um, the Lord's talking about being converted here. In John chapter 3, it says, in a discussion he was having with a religious leader, there was a man of the Pharisees in verse 1 named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi or Master, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. And so just in this one chapter it tells us that he went to see Jesus because neither of them were busy at that time, most likely. In the evening, Jesus sometimes preached. If he was invited for a meal someplace, he, he would preach, but generally he did all his preaching during the day. And this Pharisee was available too. So he got to Jesus to himself and he says, look, I believe in you. You're doing the miracles. You're from God. But what's the answer? What's it all about? And Jesus answered and said to him, verily, verily, it's a bit of old English, saying most importantly, this is what I want you to understand. I say to you, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The new covenant, what Jesus is about, is a person being born again, a new start, a new beginning, a new life. And so Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So Nicodemus understood that Jesus was talking about a real experience, not a similitude or, or a, um, a metaphor about you know changing your life or having a new start, but a literal birth. He's saying, well, you know, how do I go back and start again? And Jesus said in verse 5, Verily, verily, we know that means most importantly, I say to you, except the man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God is heaven. Can't go to heaven. 
right? This is the new covenant. So it's not Ten Commandments and the law of Moses and the ways of doing things, you know, do's and don'ts. This is a matter of receiving something from God, a life from God. And he says, Marvel not, I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it listeth, and you hear the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it comes or whither it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. And uh, that's a good little description there. You, you, you feel wind, you experience wind, but you don't see, oh, there goes wind, right? You know, it's just movement of air. And uh, the literal meaning is, is spirit, I know, but he's saying that the identifying um, sound or identifying um, uh, manifestation is you'll hear the sound. So literally in the Greek, uh, phono, which means voice. And so there'll be this identifying voice. The spirit will give utterance. Now, to be born of water, in the Bible tells us we come out of baptism and we walk in a new life. Baptism is what we do for God. The new life is this Holy Spirit or the Spirit we read here, sometimes called Holy Spirit, Spirit of Christ, Holy Ghost, uh, been translated from the pneuma, which means spirit, several different meanings there, but the same word. And uh, that's what he's talking about, receiving the Holy Spirit. Uh, after being baptised. And so we get baptised, that's what we do. The Holy Spirit, the power of God, we're talking about, people reject, is what God wants to do for us. And so isn't that wonderfully simple? Because if nothing happens, then God isn't doing anything. And that was a challenge put to me. You know, you can find out if it's real. You don't have to know beforehand. In fact, I was quite confused, but I thought I'll do all my thinking after it happens. And if nothing happens, well, I don't have anything to think about, do I? And I, I got down and I prayed, and within three minutes I spoke in tongues. What I was thinking at the time was, I don't understand. What is it all about? A man being crucified, I can't pretend to understand. I can't pretend to say, you know, that I believe, and I spoke in tongues. You know, I was putting forward all my excuses for not measuring up, and God filled me with the Holy Spirit anyway. And uh, from that moment, it was a great joy and peace. Uh, my life changed immediately. The next day, I lit up a cigarette, couldn't finish it. Uh, I had no interest in drinking or partying. I was looking forward to the next meeting where I got baptised. And so it completely changed uh, in me uh, from somebody who was a bit of an atheist, certainly agnostic, wasn't, going to, wasn't really interested in going to church. It took me a year to get to my first meeting. I just thought, it's not for me. You know, I'm just not into that uh, religion and so forth to suddenly being filled with spirit. It was a bit of a shock to my friends and family, but nevertheless, it was real. I couldn't deny it. And so that's what it's talking about there. We can see a lot of examples. I'm not going to go through it, but the disciples received the Holy Spirit first with Jesus' mother, his brothers and sisters, you know, at least two brothers, Jude and James, received the Holy Spirit Probably uh, Mary and Martha and Lazarus was there. About 120, the Bible tells us, all praying on this day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and all spoke in tongues as they received the Holy Spirit. We read about 3,000 later that day. We read about, you know, in Acts 10, the Gentiles, Romans, Greeks, people who knew nothing about the Bible, all received the Holy Spirit in one room, in one house at the same time as I spoke in tongues. So, so it is pretty clear, it's not complicated, that this experience comes from God and it's going to happen to you. It's going to make a believer out of you. And that's the purpose. It's because, you know, we, we um, can be God conscious and completely wrong. And uh, the Bible wants us to know the truth. Let's go to another scripture in John chapter 8. I like reminding myself how simple it is because you can get a bit complicated, you know, working out meanings of words and, you know, and, and uh, you know, what, what God perhaps expects of us. There are different things, lots of advice for us in the Bible. Uh, I'm going to look at another scripture in a moment. So we can travel first class. You know, I, I went to Kalgoorlie the week before last, had to work in Kalgoorlie, and um, there was a shortage of seats, and I got to travel not first class, but business class. Cost seven hundred and something dollars, about at least twice the price of a normal ticket. And boy, they spoiled me. You know, as soon as I was in there, the plane hadn't even been loaded up. People were trying to get in, and they served me drinks and you know hot breakfast and all this sort of stuff. 
And I thought, this is not bad, you know. I was happy in economy class, but, you know, there's a bit more room. There's only two seats um, between the aisles instead of three. And so I had a bit more room, and, and it was good. And took my mind off the fact that I got up at 3.30 in the morning to catch the flight, or, or what I was going to do at work. You know, the time passed really quickly. And uh, it was a good journey. And that's what God wants for us. He gives us advice because we go through this life, different situations we find ourselves in. But at the end of the day, you know, we, we uh, still belong to God. We're still saved. And so in John chapter 8 here, talking about truth, verse 30, it's a great scripture. It says, And he spoke these words, and many believed on him. And then said Jesus unto those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples, my followers, indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And again, you know, the disciples who followed Jesus, they were um, quite confused. You know, Peter denied Christ three times. At one stage, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You've, you've got the wrong understanding. You're saying the wrong things. You know, uh, listen. And, uh, but in this stage, this promise here, this prophecy here is that the time comes when you see the spirit of truth, that's what's described that in, in Romans 8, then um, you suddenly realise, i found the answer. When you receive the Holy Spirit, the search is over. You don't have to believe the man at the front or anybody. You've found God. God's working in your life. And there's a wonderful scripture that says he'll never, never leave you nor forsake you. And so this aspect of how simple it is, God gives us this understanding of the truth. This gives us this realisation as we just continue following his advice. Not Buddha's or Muhammad's or somebody else's advice. What Jesus said. You know, not the Pope or Joseph Smith or somebody else. There's a lot of people come on the scene and people flock to them. And they seem to have the answers, but they don't use the word of God. Let's go to another scripture, 2 Timothy again. And we'll go back to Timothy. Timothy, a young fellow in... Uh, in charge of the, uh, the church at Ephesus. And, uh, and what we're seeing here is the Lord's giving plenty of advice to do the job. And it's the same advice that we need. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse uh, 15, we'll read. So study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun provane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And so everybody has an opinion, don't they? And uh, what the Bible's encouraging us is the word study is a bit strong. It's actually in the, in the Greek, it means it's a word called spudazo, spudazo, well, that's how it is, I'll say. Spudazo, yes. And it means to be eager, diligent. And doesn't that happen to us? When we get filled with spirit, you know, it's all exciting. The Bible's real and we, we're looking for, uh, you know, what the Bible says has happened to us and what's going to happen next. And, and we're looking for answers so we can tell our friends and our family, you know, what's going on, you know. And, uh, you know, we, I, I was a bit like a stunned mullet for a while there because I didn't expect anything to happen. And I'm thinking, wow. Now I've got to say words like God and Jesus. But, but you know, it was real and it was fun and it was exciting and, and I could recommend it to people because it wasn't hard. But I did. I just prayed and three minutes later I was speaking in tongues and I had this joy and this peace and I felt clean and that I'd come home. I, I, the search was over. The frustration or, or never really being satisfied by anything, being dissatisfied and discontent was over. I found this peace. But, you know, that's just me and others have a similar testimony, you know, and a lot more perhaps than that. But we read that the, the Bible is encouraging us to be quick to show ourselves approved. It's not a matter, you get filled with spirit and you go off to a monastery for a couple of years and you learn the Bible. And suddenly you've got the answers. You know that Mark 16, these signs follow believers. You know Acts 2, you repent and be baptised. Mission of sins, you receive the Holy Ghost. You know, John 3, we just read there, they're born again. You know, things that people have never heard of and uh, that God has promised to honour if we do these things, connect to God. And so these are the scriptures that, that talk about a new life. We suddenly want to, we're eager, you know, we're enthusiastic to talk about God, 
for the first time in our life, perhaps, because we've got something to say, we've got something to recommend. Can you imagine yourself being like that? I couldn't. I listened to my friend for a year. We were studying, so it was pretty much every weekday for a year. And, um, and I had listened to him. I felt sorry for him initially because nobody uh, would listen to him, but I did because I thought, I'll never do anything. I'm safe. You know, I'm not looking to be religious. Um, and yet at the end of the year, I still wasn't any wiser because I hadn't experienced it. But once I did, uh, once I was connected by the, the Holy Spirit to God, then um, it was very easy to enjoy this new life. And so it doesn't get more complicated, it gets easier because I wasn't confused anymore. I wasn't in darkness. You know, I'd seen the light. I, I had the answers. I'd found the truth. Uh, it wasn't religion. It was Christianity. It was what Jesus promised. And that can happen to you. We'll go to 3 John, 3 John chapter 1. And so as, perhaps as you hear me uh, explain these scriptures, you're hearing me remind myself of how things began. And it hasn't changed much. You know, I'm still the same person I was, you know, that, all those years ago. I still uh, enjoy the scriptures, still discover new things or rediscover things. I go through experiences um, that the Bible talks about, you know, healing needs, provision, you know, things to pray about. The Bible encourages us there and all those topics. But it's, you know, it's still good life and still simple. And so here in 3 John, and it's up the back of your Bible, you've got 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, um, epistles there that are written by the Apostle John. In chapter um, 1, 1, and verse 1, we'll read, That which uh, was from the beginning, which was which uh, we have heard... No, sorry, that's the first epistle of John. Sorry, going to the 3. Let's read here. The elder uh, unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth, Beloved, I wish above all things that you mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. Wow, that sounds good, doesn't it? That's what God wants for us, to prosper. The word actually means to have a good journey. You know, back to my flight to Kalgoorlie uh, analogy there. To have a good journey. You know, it means you get up and every day, you know, is a sort of an adventure, trusting in God. Is going through things, you know, facing things and praying about things and, and testifying about things. You know, it's a day by day relationship with God. You don't get filled with spirit and you just stagnate, right? That's it. You know, that's your experience in life. There's more and uh, different things. But God's will here, as we read, and, and the Apostle John and encouraging the church is saying, look, all I want is to see you happy and healthy and, and, um, having a good journey uh, because your soul's prospering. And the thing is, once we get the answers from God and our life changes and we tune in, uh, you know, on, on uh, caring about people and loving the brethren, then the fruits of the Spirit develop, right, without even learning about them. I didn't know about them, and yet I'd had love and joy and peace and temperance and long-suffering and faith and gentleness and godliness. All these things were coming out in my life and the new life I had by the Spirit. As I enjoyed the fellowship and cared about the brethren and, you know, went out and witnessed to a few people and talked about, you know, what I'd received, my life just automatically changed. So different fruit, different results was happening in my life instead of anger or bitterness or, you know, malice or depression or, or some of these other things that, um, you know, we experienced before. We got filled with spirits, being lost, being empty. Uh, our life suddenly full and, and fruitful. And I'm not going to Ephesians today, but, but this is John's um, uh, account of why he's involved with these people. Uh, Paul's account back in 2 Corinthians was, he says, you know, I want to be a helper of your joy. I don't want to control your life. I want you to grow in the things of the Lord and abound and get your victories and overcome and, and testify and, and enjoy your life in the Lord. Because Jesus died to give us a good life. He died to give us health. Died to, to uh, that our, our joy would be full, he said uh, back there in John 16. So keep that in your mind when you're going through life, as God wants to heal you. God wants you to be happy. God wants to provide. He's, he wants to be your father. And these things become real when you receive the Holy Spirit. As I say, I couldn't pretend to imagine these things beforehand. You know, it sounded good. And a lot of people wished that to happen in their lives. But I didn't see any evidence of it. 
and um, you know I end up just trying to look after myself. Uh, but uh, when I got filled with spirit, uh, God stepped in, and which is great, isn't it? One Timothy six, probably second last scripture here. We are quick today, but so I'll talk a bit about this. Uh, One Timothy chapter six. I thought with eight scriptures I was pushing it, but um, we're doing well. One Timothy chapter six. And this is getting back to the point I made about travelling first class. There's a lot of advice in the Bible, and and, um, and you can feel if you if you. Um, I suppose if you if you're young in the Lord, says, oh, I've got to do this, and I'm not. I've got to be careful about that, and I've got to remember that, and you know, everybody seems to memorise all the scriptures. They know all the scriptures, and I don't know anything. You know, it's, like, it's just like you know, as the Bible says, we're just a babe in the things of the Lord. There's no pressure to grow. Uh, after all, we've often come from situations. I remember baptising a couple of girls from China who didn't understand English. I don't know why they were studying Australia. They didn't understand English and, uh, and yet still got filled with the Holy Spirit. Quite amazing. But, of course, didn't know what they had at that stage. 1 Timothy 6 is a bit of advice. and We talk about how the Lord advises us. And this is just an example of why the Bible is, is so thick. There's an advice on how to avoid problems, advice you know, how to enjoy the good life. For example, a lot of advice on forgiving. And you sort of think, well, you know, I've been hard done by. Why do I have to forgive? You know, they've got to apologise. You know, they've got to, you know, they owe me. Right? Why, why am I having to do all the hard work forgiving? And the Bible explains because, you know, you, you lose your peace by, by not forgiving. You lose your joy. You lose, you know, your confidence uh, in life because uh, you're bitter about somebody else. And if we can forgive them, then we can move on, you know, make peace. But if we don't, then we very often make the situation worse and worse and worse because we want to get revenge or maybe get even or something like that. And it's not the life of the Christian. So there's good advice here in Timothy. We're reading here, it says here in verse 6, chapter 6, verse 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain. You know, when I think about travelling first class, no worries, no anxiety, no stress, no problems, content. Right? And, and as I said in my testimony before, I did a lot of good things, travelled and enjoyed myself, but there was always something missing. And I'm sure it was God calling me, you know, and humbling me, I suppose, and getting me ready for the day when I respond to the gospel, because when I received the Holy Spirit, that changed. I was content. Been content since, you know. Um, you know, we have needs to pray about and things going on in their life, but this is really travelling first class, to be right with God and content with what you've got, not needing anything, not you know, worrying about anything. As he goes on to say in verse 7, For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing or raiment or protection from the weather, uh, uh, we therewith be content. So, you know, we, we've got food, we've got, you know, a warm place to, to live and some decent clothes, warm clothes, then we can function in life. We can witness, we can go to work, we can do all of these things, you know, what more do you need? But they that uh, will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil which while some covered after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And you can sell off your contentment by thinking, oh, I've got to get rich, you know, I've got to, re got to retire at 30. No, what do they say, retire at 50 or something like that. You know, oh, I'm worried about my retirement and, you know, I've got to work harder and I've got to save more and, you know, maybe invest in a second house and rent that out to somebody. All these sort of things that we're taught in this world is how to prosper, how to, how to you know, be wise. And all of a sudden, you know, if you're content, if you're happy with what you've got, then um, that's the true uh, riches in life. And it says here, but thou, O man, flee these things, in verse 11, and follow after righteousness, you know, understanding a relationship with God. And godliness, you know, how your life has changed for the better. 
and faith, you know, doing what you believe and love, caring for the brethren and the lords and people and uh, patience and meekness. And, and so there's a new us that's growing and prospering. We can always go back to the old us, you know, you can go back to that. Sometimes, you know, you might shock yourself and, and um, you know, something else comes out in your thoughts instead of what you normally think. You think, oh, I've got to get control of that, you know, I can't. You know, behave like that or, or speak like that. But, um, but you know, we're, we're pretty happy with what God's doing and we like the new person we've been made and all the people said because, you know, we, um, we're, we're the person we always wanted to be, you know, happy and content, you know, with peace in our lives and, you know, God that answers prayer. And the last scripture, let's look at the last one, Philippians 1. It's not a, a long scripture but one of my favourites because... Got all the guys lined up there ready for communion. Thank you. I won't keep you long. Because it just gives us confidence in our relationship with each other and, and with God. We read in verse 1, Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints of Christ Jesus which are in Philippi, uh, with the, the bishops or the pastors and deacons, the elders there, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, I thank my God upon every remembrance or mention of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. For even it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, as much as both in my bonds and in the defence of the confirmation of the gospel, you're all partakers of my grace. We're all in it together. We're all in the, in the favour of God. We're all enjoying this life and got a future to look forward, a real one, eternal life. It's not, uh, you know, uh, a fantasy or a fable. It's real. It's why we got filled with spirit. And uh, the Lord's reminding us here, God's begun to work in us. And maybe it just seems like a little bit has been achieved and there's a fair bit more to do, but there's time. We've got as long as it takes until the Lord comes back, you know, to grow in the Lord, achieve things we want to achieve in the Lord, see him work in our life, maybe something we've been waiting on the Lord, a healing or something. You know, I think of Kara's testament recently, 10 years she waited for a healing and she got it, right? Jumping up and down, exciting, isn't it? You know, as we just keep depending on the Lord, he comes through and he meets our needs. But in the meantime, he's changing us. He's using us. And, uh, you know, things are happening in our life for the better. That's why the Bible says give thanks for all things. You know, it's character building, as we heard the other night. Or, or maybe it's just experience. But, um, you know, God's in charge. And, and that's great to know, isn't it? He's got confidence with us to preach his gospel, you know, to look after each other, you know, to be there on the day. And he doesn't expect any of us to fail. And that's just great. And all people said, amen. All right, we'll hand over to uh, handsome Jeff. Is that right? Thanks, Jeff.